Now let's look at the meaning of this parable. It is profound. It is huge. It is enormous. It is a profound teaching. Please, I don't want you to miss it. Well, the King of Glory, or the Son of Man, is obviously Jesus Christ. The sheep, those who took care of the Jews and entered the Kingdom Age because of it, or the Millennium. Synonymous is the Kingdom Age with the Millennium. Who are the goats? The goats are those who did not take care for the Jews, and they, as a result, consequently, do not enter the kingdom age. Who are the brethren, or the least of these? I believe, and Bible teachers kind of, some say it's just the Jews who get saved in the tribulation. Because again, what is the purpose of the tribulation? It's for the salvation of the Jewish nation. I believe that it makes up a constituency of not just Jews, but I believe possibly Gentiles as well. Because, you see, Jesus, when asked, he was told, your mom and your brothers, and by the way, Joseph and Mary did have other children. Uh, James, the New Testament epistle of James, that's Jesus' half-brother. <laughs> I just want to, you to know that. Could you imagine that, uh, growing up as the, the Savior's brother? <laughs> you imagine Joseph and Mary? James. How come you don't keep your room as clean as Jesus? <laughs> come on, what? <laughs> Always comparing your... I don't think I did that. Poor guy. That's why when you read the epistle of James, you kind of walk away from it with the impression that what you see is what you get. He doesn't mince words. <laughs> you can't blame him, you know, being uh, Jesus' half-brother. But when Jesus was approached, and he said, hey, Jesus, your, your mom's here, your, your, your brother and, you know, brothers and sisters are here. Uh, he said, no, who are my brothers and sisters? They are those who obey me, who follow me. They are the ones who are believers in me. So that is who are his brethren. So I believe that it is those made up of both Jews and Gentiles as well who are saved during the tribulation. And that's who he's talking about. Now, I love Warren Wiersbe's commentary on this. He says, since they, the least of these brethren, would be enemies of the Antichrist, because again, this is during the tribulation now. This parable at the end of Matthew 25 is describing for us and illustrating for us what it's going to be like at the end of the tribulation. These least of these who get saved during the tribulation, as difficult as it is, will be enemies of the Antichrist, and they would suffer great persecution. They would not be able to buy or sell because they have not accepted the mark of the Antichrist, and thus they would be hungry. They would flee from their homes and would need a place to stay. That's why Jesus said, when you took me in as a stranger. Uh, they would be without jobs. They would, because of, they would be without the mark of the beast, they would not be able to secure clothing, and many would be cast into prison. So there will be those who, like during the Holocaust, protected God's chosen people, and will show love to them by hiding them, tending to them, feeding them, clothing them, and visiting them in prison. Now, it's important to know that these acts of kindness are not good works that save them. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, you're familiar with it. You're not, you, you, we are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. This is not the litmus test that grants them access into the kingdom age, because again, at the end of the millennium, or the kingdom age, that's when they're going to make their decision between Jesus Christ and the devil. There were many uh, people who were not necessarily believers in Jesus Christ that tended to and took care of the Jews during the Holocaust. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were believers. Now, I believe that the believers are going to be the ones who will need to be taken care of during the seven-year tribulation. And this will be a proof of their faith 
in the message and their love for Christ. Because it's, it's, you can't love God and not love God's people. That's why the first five commandments are all about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second five are about loving your neighbor. The, the first five are vertical. And the second five commandments are horizontal in the shape of a cross. That's not coincidence, by the way. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture of a cross. Even when the Israelites were to, commanded to take a spotless lamb, inspect it for four days, the way Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was inspected for four days. If found without spot or wrinkle, he was to be slain, and the blood was to be placed so that the angel of death would pass over them on their door, top, bottom, side, side, in the shape of a cross. When the priests would present their offering at the altar, they would do the wave offering. I know I've said this before, but I never tire of saying this because I think that the, the scriptures are very fascinating in the Old Testament. And I'm even now praying about, uh, you know, starting in the Old Testament when we finish with Matthew. It is so rich, the Old Testament, because the wave offering was up and down and left to right in the shape of a cross. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to the person of Jesus Christ, both his first coming and subsequently his second coming. See? So this is uh, interesting to me that if you're in alignment with God, first five commandments vertical, then you'll be in alignment with your neighbor, second five commandments horizontal. You know, I don't mean to make light of marriage problems or, you know, problems that Christians face in their life, but I submit to you, at the risk of maybe offering and presenting an oversimplification, that a lot of times our problem is not with our spouse or with our employees or an employer or our neighbor or our whoever, you fill in the blank. Our problem is with the Lord. We got, we're out of alignment with the Lord. If I'm out of fellowship with God, I'm going to be out of fellowship with you. If I'm in fellowship with you and I love, it's because I'm in fellowship with God. If I love God, I'm going to love you. And that is the, the, the greatest commandment that fulfills the law. If I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and strength, it is the catalyst for me to love you as I already love myself. And make no mistake about it, I love me. I love you very much. This thing about you need to love yourself. <laughs> Give me a break. You gotta be kidding me. You you love you. I know you do. You think about you all the time. <laughs> when you walk by a window, don't you look at you to see how you look? True. When you get photographs back from the you know, uh, developing. Do you look for, you look for the, if you're in that picture, who are you looking at? You! You're looking at you! I was reading in my devotions in Oswald Chambers um, uh, <laughs> writing, and uh, he said that discouragement is disenchantment of self-love. Think about that. Discouragement is disenchantment of self-love. You know, to, to get down on yourself and discouraged and, and defeated, and it's, it's because your eyes are on yourself. Listen, we already love ourselves. And what Jesus is saying is, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then it will be the catalyst for you to fulfill the second five commandments, and that is to love others as you already love yourself. Show me a Christian who is loving, it's the fruit of the Spirit, singular. It's not fruits. Galatians says it is the fruit of the Spirit, love. From love comes joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, kindness, patience. <laughs> Let's not talk too much about that one. And self-control. That is the sweetness that comes from the right fruit, singular, of love. See? 